I wish uh, I can have the same kind of career Coach Rocos had, you know, here at uh, CU. He's obviously a well-established, very decorated, very impactful coach that uh, made a difference in a number of of his athletes in a number of ways, and and uh, he's a good man. I met him my first time here in 1992, when I was a young coach, and you know he was actually it's been about 20 you know, over 20 years, so it's good to, that he's kind of finished his career the way he wanted to. So that, anyway, going back into what we're doing, this is kind of football season starting up. Um, we've had our eighth practice today. Things are going really well. Um, as you can imagine, uh, legs are getting tired. You know, right now we're at that point in camp, and that's the physical part of the camp where you get ready for a season. Um, but our team is playing hard and practicing hard and competing well against each other. Um, we feel like we're, uh, we're making progress, you know, each and every day. Even this today, we, is a, we had a shorter practice. We're having a scrimmage tomorrow. But we had some really good work, competitive work against each other. And it was uh, fun to see. You know, some guys are really starting to blossom and season into positions. And, you know, some young players are starting to, you know, maybe have a role with what we're doing. And, you know, so we're, we've still got quite a ways to go. You know, it's eight of 25 practices before the first game. Um, but I think the progress and things are starting to uh, really, you know, kind of hone in, so to speak. So we feel good about, you know, the process of what we're doing. You know, we're, we're doing some really good things. Um, you know, I think the quarterback position is extremely competitive. I'm sure that's going to be a question with what that's all about. And that's been really uh, nip and tuck between uh, both Bre uh, Brendan and, and JT, uh, which is the way I'd like it, you know, where those guys are really competing hard and they're, they're having success. And it's going to make it a hard decision on us, which, again, that's always hard on us. But... I think they're, they're great uh, young players that get along well with each other and they push each other. And that's what I like. You know, they have a great relationship off the field and they compete like you know what on the field. So it's good to have that type of uh, relationship within that group. And some couple of young guys with Drew Carter and, and uh, Jordan Wolverton, those are the, the next two. Uh, so it's a good young group of quarterbacks. You know, there's, the oldest is a sophomore. And everyone else are freshmen, so it's a it's a young group, and and maybe that group can continue to grow and mature and, and do some really good things, and that's what our expectations are. So, uh, good day today. I'm sure you guys have maybe a question or two. Maybe that's it, but uh, I'm just kidding. Um, Brian Howell would at least have at least three or four, I'm sure. But um, anyway, I want to open up the floor for you guys, please. Uh, Joe Rico, my life sports radio coach. And uh, when do you feel comfortable that you have enough time in naming a starting quarterback without mentioning who that is? When do you feel the timetable is to for for your team to get ready for September third and the Bears? Do you have an idea of what day that'll be, or are you going to let this play out? We're going to let it play out a little further uh, with the competition. We're going to have a a big test tomorrow, which I think is important. Then we're going to have another test the following Saturday. So, you know, I think with giving a couple of scrimmages under our belt, you know, will give us a little better, you know, maybe a better light as to what direction we should go. Um, if I had to predict it right now, it's going to be really tough because they both have been like literally 1A and 1B. They both are playing really well. But we'll see if there's some separation. You know, that's what we're trying to see, you know, when the coaches are off the field and they're playing the game and, and they're, you know, they're managing the offense and making decisions and, you know, being efficient with what we're doing offensively. So those are the parameters that we want to see them play with when no one's in their ear, you know. So, but I think it's going to be at least a couple more weeks. Carl, you guys had a pretty busy winter and early spring with respect to the transfer portal, bringing in some reinforcements on the offensive line at linebacker JT Shroud, obviously. At this point in camp, it has, collectively, has that group of transfers uh, met your expectations, exceeded them, or, or I guess in any way uh, fallen short of expectations? I would say everything above except for what the – they didn't fall short of expectations. You know, they met the expectations that we were um, hoping to have, which was building our depth and having some guys with some experience that have played uh, Division One football. And, you know, so all of those guys that you've mentioned are, are really 
instrumental pieces for us to be successful this year. You know, JT Stroud, as you mentioned, he's competing for the quarterback job. And, you know, Max Ray is, you know, he's competing to, to be a starting tackle. Um, you know, on the defensive side, we have a few more pieces over there. And, you know, with, you know, we have Jack Lamb and, and Robert Barnes, our linebackers. Those guys are really doing a nice job. You know, uh, Blaine Toll, um, he's been out a little bit with, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, he had uh, some concussion-like symptoms early in practice, but he's back at practice now. So he hasn't had a lot of reps, but the reps that he had, he showed up quickly <laughs> as being a really good player. So we think he's going to be a factor in what we're doing. So I think the guys that you know we've mentioned that we've we've selected from the portal are really going to help us. I mean, there there are no there's no duds, I guess, in answering that that latter part of your question. They're going to really be part of our depth and and really help us, you know, be a better football team this year. Hi, my name is uh, Nikki Edwards. Last season, you know, there were some tough injuries on the team. This is a simple question, but how important it is to you to keep all of your men healthy and playing, and how do you protect them um, on the field, or how do they protect themselves? That's a great question because that's a day-to-day, -day, you know, measure that I that as we practice, I'm trying to maximize our production, what we're trying to get accomplished in practice, and trying to also not get to give too many guys too many reps. So that's where the depth thing ends up really helping us. Our depth is better this year than last year. So, you know, for example, a guy like Carson Wells, he doesn't need it. He, you know, Carson Wells and, and Joska Gustav, the outside backer position, you know, in the springtime, because of, we had a couple other outside backers that were hurt, they took prim primarily 90% of the snaps of everything that we did in the spring. And that's, you know, we don't need Carson Wells to be taking that many snaps, him being the type of player, veteran player, and, and knows our system really well. But now with the addition with Jamar's back, Guy Thomas is back. You know, we have uh, Zion Mangale, that's, that's a young freshman that's competing. We have so much more depth, so we're actually getting Carson to be more of a coach to, to help bring those younger players along. And, and so he doesn't need to, to be in that situation like he was in the spring. So we're, that's a delicate balance that I try to, to handle as we go through practice and, and not to overload any of our guys so that, you know, we, we want to start the season on a healthier note. And, um, but things are going pretty well. So far, it's been a bunch of muscle, you know, I would say bumps and bruises, minor strains, stuff like that, which is part of the conditioning of why you're in camp. And, you know, that's what we're doing right now. We haven't lost anything of uh, significance in terms of guys that are going to be out for months or weeks or anything like that. So, uh, so far, so good. You know, the team's getting in shape. And, but that's, that's a big management thing that I, that I do try to be conscious of as we go forward. Hey, Carl. Um, as you look at the landscape over here, as you look at the landscape in the conference or, or even the country, but particularly with your program, how has the NIL decision from the NCAA uh, this summer kind of changed things, and how do you guys stay on top of uh, on that, make sure that it becomes you know something you don't fall behind in or that you stay, stay on top as far as uh, competitively? We're trying to stay on top of it as, as best we can from a department standpoint. And, you know, we, we are trying to, you know, with, within our guidelines and our own Colorado laws, you know, we're trying to do what we can for our, you know, our student athletes in relation to NIL. The challenging part of it is that every state's different, you know, so there's, there's more leniency in other states than ours. And sometimes you're seeing things that are, that are a little bit more, I would say, lucrative that another program is doing from another state. And, you know, sometimes the public thinks, so how come we're not doing that? Or why is this so-and-so doing this? And, you know, you know that, that type of discussion. But that's, that's the challenge of it all, is that it's the way the NCAA has put it on, on us as, as universities is that it's, they said, you know what, you guys are governed by your own state laws. And they kind of, in a way, wipe their hands of that. So we're dealing with, okay, what can we do? You know, we're discovering within our guidelines, what can we do to help maximize some of those opportunities for our guys? Um, so it, it's, it, we're still in discovery mode, I would say. We're still trying to figure all those things out. It's still fairly new. And, you know, we're, we're, but guys are getting some opportunities for certain things, which is good. 
Um, I don't want it to be a distraction for what the purpose of what we're doing, which is playing this season and, you know, and having a successful season. And I, I did tell the team this, and it makes sense. I'm sure it hopefully makes sense to you guys is that, well, you know, it, making a name for yourself, it starts, it really starts there. You know, it starts with, you know, the great public perception of yourself, you know, the production you've done, you're getting recognition. You know, usually when those things start to happen, then the, you know, all the other stuff that's around the, the student athlete will start to come, come about. So I've kind of grounded our team and say, hey, we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> so if we haven't done anything yet, don't expect much. So let's do something to make a great product out there that we play and people are, uh, feel, find that we're appealing to watch and, and you're playing well. And then I think that's when you start making a name for yourself. So we're, I think we're at the bottom of that. We're, let's, let's do something great for us to, to get what we deserve. So that's usually my, the way of putting it for our guys. So not to really get too tied into that. Hi, Coach. Last year you're dealing with daily testing and all of the uncertainty day to day. Just how is the morale within your program different this preseason you know, from the coaching staff, staff on down? The morale is shot through the roof because – you know, we had to test every day at 5.15 in the morning, and we practiced. We had to wait for the results before we can actually step on the field and practice. So if you can imagine doing that every day of the season, that's a challenge for young people that are are in school and they're working late at night to do projects or papers and all that stuff. But yet that was what was governed with how, what we had to do last last year. And, our, you know, I've, you've heard me say last year about that 2020 team, they were very resilient you know, that's one thing I, I was very proud of who they were in terms of how they handled everything. And they just listened to what we were telling them to do and, and went along with it. I think now in present day with, you know, there's we've got about 94, 95 percent of our team vaccinated right now. The goodness is that they're not testing. And the only ones that have to test are the ones that that are still kind of in discovery about whether they want to pull the trigger or not. And so it's, it's less than a handful of guys that have to test you know, during the during training camp, you know, every other day or something like that, where everybody else has been vaccinated doesn't have to test. So after a while, it gets pretty rewarding that, you know, if you don't want to test, get yourself vaccinated. So and so we're still working on our team. We're not quite 100 percent yet, but we're very close. And, you know, these guys are starting to see the big picture. And, you know, and I, I, res I respect that. And. So things are going in the right direction, but in terms of the morale and everything, dealing what we did last year to this year is completely different in a good way. Coach Brandon Cristal from KOA, kind of following up on that, how, how often are you guys having conversations about the guys still being smart with how they, you know, even though they're vaccinated, they could still, you know, catch the Delta variant or, or something to make sure it's a non-issue where games become in jeopardy or something like that? Really, as much as the information that comes out that we get, we try to feed that to them for really for the position of getting vaccinated. <laughs> so we're still, you know, pressing on on those guys of understanding how the season could work. For example, you know, we know that we're going to have to fly to go and play on the road. And some of these uh, some of our, you know, our charter company that that is uh, supplying our travel, you know, their whole airline company is vaccinated. So they're asking us if we're vaccinated because the question came up, do we have to wear a mask on the airplanes? So and they said, well, if everyone's vaccinated, not. So that's one of those things we put in favor of. Well, if you get yourself vaccinated, you don't have to worry about this scenario or we would have to possibly not travel you, you know, for a game. So we're, we're applying kind of a not a direct pressure, but kind of indirect pressure <laughs> to get the kids to understand you know, these are the outcomes if we don't get this this thing to where it should be. And I, I think they're listening and they're understanding, you know, what you know what's going to be important for, for their decision. Carl, you obviously didn't get a regular offseason last year. Uh, this year you have been able to. How have you uh, liked the college preparation uh, calendar as opposed to the NFL? How is that different or you know, what do you like about it? Hmm. I haven't had that question. Um, I would say the biggest difference college and professional is the fact that there's no recruiting. So, uh, and even though we weren't out recruiting this past spring with the dead period and all that stuff, I think you're still 
working on recruiting, you know, indirectly, you're still doing Zooms, all those things that led to the month of June when they when things opened up. But in terms of the football part, it's really pretty similar. At least that's the program that I have here at Colorado. You know, most of it that I've put in the foundation of our program is NFL base. You know, that was my last 12 years that of coaching has been in the NFL. So it's really tweaked to a college framework, but it's more NFL base. Um, so we had the, you know, they took the month off in January after our bowl, and then we started training in the beginning of, of February for two months. Um, in, in the NFL, when they start training, they call, they have, you know, football school. Well, I had football school, and you guys knew that. So we did football school as we trained, you know, really doing on the specifics of the position and understanding certain, you know, things about, you know, the game and that led into spring practice, which was in April. And then they had the month of uh, May off after finals, and then they came back and started training in June. So, you know, it's very similar. We're in the NFL calendars. For, they just start up in April. Um, they kind of build as they go. It goes into OTA practices, which is like spring practice. Um, that's after the draft. And, you know, so they, they do the OTA sessions for, you know, at least the end of May. And then they have a, a mandatory mini camp in June. And then after that mandatory mini camp in June, they get a break. And then they start their training camp third, fourth week of July. So it's very similar. I just did it to a, a college calendar. Hey, Carl, with uh, Brendan Lewis last season, how many, how much did you see what he did in the Alamo as flashes in practice during the year? And how much have you seen a growth in him just in the mental part of the game and really understanding the offense? Brendan's grown so much. I mean, he's, you know, to the, the come in the game, which was his first snap of a, of a football game at the college level was in the bowl game, you know, really in the heat of a co competitive match. He came in and, and, in my opinion, played – he exceeded my expectations. And sure, he did glimpses of those things in practice, but you know, practice is practice, right? And when the lights are on and you're playing against someone you don't, you're not real familiar with and you haven't had many reps you know, in terms of your preparation, he stepped in and, and played like he belonged out there. You know, he did, he had confidence and he moved the football, he made plays with his legs, he made plays with his arm. You know, I was really impressed by that. And I think it, for himself, it validated for him that, yes, I belong here. I can play at this level. I can, and, and even though well, he had minimal reps throughout the season, you know, he came in and really was lights out. So he attacked the, out, the off season very confidently in his training, in his work, his preparation. He had a good spring, he had a great summer. That's why we're in the situation we are because he is very, very confident in what he can do. And more importantly than, than him having confidence, we have a lot of confidence in him too. So he's, he's really night and day difference from, from where he was last fall. Coach, Alex Ramirez, My Life Sports Radio. You had mentioned uh, the depth on this team, and let's, let's dive into the, the, the running back room here for a second. Uh, Jarek Broussard obviously had a great season last year, but you also have some other running backs, Alex Fontenot and Joe Davis, and the list goes on. Uh, do you believe this year, now that the, uh, the schedule is 12 games, the, the carries for Jer uh, Jarek Broussard might lessen a little bit and have more distribution for your running backs? There should be more distribution for our running backs, you know, for a number of reasons. You know, we have more depth now. You know, uh, when Jarrett came out, we, we lost two backs last year, if you can imagine. We lost both Deion Smith and Alex Fontenot. We had a young freshman in Ashad Clayton and, and Josiah Davis, and then and a young freshman in Jay Lee Stack. So we had two, two of the three that were kind of behind, um, you know, Jarek weren't really quite ready to play. And so he took a lot of snaps. I would say a year later, you know, Alex is back. You know, Deion Smith is back. Um, obviously, Ashad Clayton is much better now than where he was, you know, last fall. So the depth of that position is going to allow us to, to not really put our, you know, use one, one workhorse, so to speak, in the backfield. And, and they all understand that. You know, Jarek even understands that even after the year that he, he had, he understands that this year he won't have those games where he's had 30-plus carries, which he had at least two or three times last year. But we're, we think he's, he's a dynamic player. He's a completely different player as well with, you know, he doesn't have that Linus knee brace anymore. You know, that's gone. 
Um, and he's, he's, he's having a good camp so far. But I think he also knows, and we've kind of given him the, and he sees the, you know, the depth in the room, he's probably not going to be in that, that threshold like he was last year. Hey, Carl, I just wanted to circle back. Uh, you mentioned your um, players are almost 100% vaccinated. Is, is your staff, uh, coaching staff, 100% vaccinated? And then I have a follow. They are 98.9. You know, there's a couple of them have their one shot in and they need to get their second shot. So we have two or three that are waiting for their second shot. So I would say within the next 10 days, we probably will be. Okay. And then, uh, like in the NFL, there's a whole bunch of disincentives. For, for not getting vaccinated, you know, the players, uh, like you were mentioning, you guys have to test every morning. Um, but then they also can't meet with their position coaches, can't go to the locker room, have to wear masks indoors. Is, is there some, something similar with your players that are not vaccinated? Like, do they have other restrictions on them besides just having to test every morning? They have to wear masks in meetings. You know, anytime we're indoors, uh, they have to wear masks. And that was something that our school, our policy of the campus, uh, instituted. Um, so that's, that's helpful, uh, is I guess in a way of trying to protect the, the bigger part of the herd, but it's also, uh, you know, we're trying to do what's right for, you know, for the program. And so it, they have to wear masks indoors, you know, when we're practicing, they're not wearing masks, but you know, that's something that has been instituted here that they have to do when we're in meetings and stuff like that. So they're still present in meetings. Team meetings, position meetings, all those things. They just have a mask on. Coach, uh, it's uh, so much easier for athletes to um, transfer to another school through the transfer portal. Th things have changed for the, to benefit student athletes. But as a coach and as a coaching staff, does that put added pressure on you um, to make sure a player is satisfied, happy being here? Hmm. I would say the, the, the transfer legislation that's in now is it's going to be challenging for everyone. So when you say to keep a player happy, um, we're paying for a scholarship, we're paying for his education. You know, we're, we're, we're going to play a great brand of football. You know, there's a lot of privileges we give these guys. So I'm not necessarily concerned about make, whether he's happy or not is whether he's productive or not. So uh, what the challenge of it all is, and you guys know, is that these kids nowadays, they do sometimes take their ball and go home. And that's part of what, you know, that's the challenge. I think every, you know, most of us as in, you know, in this profession is going to be challenged with every, every year. We're going to have a free agency every year because of how open that that door is, is now being allowed for student athletes to take. And sometimes it's not even a, a matter of whether he's happy or not. You know, he might think he has a better opportunity somewhere else. What I don't like, and I don't mind telling you, is that I don't, I don't like our, how we've uh, relieved our campus, or not campus, excuse me, our, our conference rule where they can transfer anywhere, even in conference, without any penalty. I think that's, that's going to be unfair to a certain point because I'm shaking Brian Howe's hand after the game, you know, and who knows what a coach or a player can be saying about that exchange. Hey, man, you can come here and do this. Or, you know, there's a lot of things that are out of our control now. And so to, to not have that, that transfer, you know, or at least having a penalty of sitting a year in our conference, uh, that's, that's going to hurt a lot of programs just because – you know, kids are going to do, we know what they think is best for themselves. So it's going to be challenging for everybody. You guys understand what I'm saying? It's going to be challenging for everybody. We don't really know what the effects are yet, but we'll find out pretty shortly. Just one or two more for Coach. Coach, we uh, chatted with Darren Cheverini for a few minutes yesterday, and he was talking to us about, uh, in his eyes, what will be the next step for your offense this season. And 35 points a game is something he m mentioned uh, Specifically, last year you guys averaged about 29, and so I'm wondering, just broadly speaking, if you'd uh, concur on that note. If 35 points would be a nice, healthy number, you'd like to see the offense put up, and and would that be indicative of of your offense firing at all cylinders if they could do 35 a game? 
You know, I remember being a coordinator myself where, I, you know, stats like that are important, you know, and you have to score points to win and stuff like that. As long as I have one more point than the opponent, I'm happy. If it's a 20 to 19 game and I didn't get 35, am I going to be upset? No. As long as we won the game. So I, I think I'm not all that into the stat part of it. I know that you have to have an aggressiveness offensively to put points on the board. But I believe in complementary football. You know, I, what does 35 points mean if we were already down, it was 54 to 29, and we're just in scramble mode putting points on the board, and, you know, and the game was already over in the fourth quarter. What does that mean? That, oh, I got my 35? What does that mean? So I get the idea of what there's some milestones and goals that you have in your program for that, for that you know, for the offense. But the bottom line is we got to outscore the opponent, whatever that takes. If that's scoring 50, 60 points, whatever it takes. Um, but we're going to do things that are more conducive that's going to allow us to be successful but for, that, for both sides of the ball and how we operate. We're going to be able to win games, hopefully in 10 to 9 game or, or a 60 to 58 game. You know, we, we got to do whatever it takes to win. So that's more important to me. Uh, Coach, uh, the fans are coming back, and obviously there's nothing more exciting in my mind than Folsom Field on a Saturday night, big game. I think the defenses are going to benefit from this as well. I thought a lot of defenses really had problems with no fans in the stands. I think there was some natural advantages to the offense last year. Do you find that this might be a, 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 an advantage to have the court crowd back for the defensive side of the ball? How, how important do you think that is overall for the team morale as well? I think it's huge. There's no question. I completely agree with what you said. I think it was a very good advantage for the offense not to have crowd noise. I really do, right? It was, it was a great advantage for them. And obviously having a loud stadium when you're on the defensive side and it's a home game, you know, that's that 12th man, right? So it's a huge advantage when the crowd's in the full capacity and we're you know, rocking and rolling and into the game. So yeah, we're excited about everything being back, you know, back to normal from that standpoint, having the fans back and having Folsom Field back and, you know, rocking. And, you know, I think our players will be inspired on both sides of the ball for, about that, but it definitely helps the defense. There's no question. All right, thanks, Coach. Appreciate right. it. Okay, thank you. Um, we have defensive players and assistant coaches over here. I'll ask if you requested an assistant coach to try to mount that up.